Maze. Maze is everywhere. They funded seed companies and agro dealers to distribute the maize to small scale farmers. This is the main production that corporations are using to invade the food system of different countries. Profit darf nicht im Mittelpunkt sein. Profit can't be the focal point of our food systems. We still have 70% of people with hunger in the rural areas in Zambia. Hunger is one of the biggest crimes in our days. Hunger has always been misunderstood as a problem of food scarcity. It's a problem of power, a lack of power on the part of food producers and the poor. Hunger is not a fatality. We can fight against it. We really need to reconsider all the systems. False Promises, an audio feature about the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa by the Inkota Network and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. More and more people are starving across the world. And the situation is likely to get even worse as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The UN World Food Programme warns that the number of people facing acute hunger will almost double by the end of the year if no action is taken. A popular belief is that we don't produce enough. And if we just produced more across the world, fewer people would starve. But this is a total misconception. There's a surplus of commodity crops being grown and rotting outside of silos. Some people have called it a global grain glut. So it's not for a lack of food. Hunger is a structural problem. So we have a problem regarding access, a problem regarding usage, and not a production problem. Farmers, political movements and organizations across the globe are fighting for a new model of farming and fairer distribution of food. And against the influence of major industrial seed producers and agrochemistry companies. My name is Mamadou Goeta, I'm from Mali, and then I'm a uh, director of a association called IRPAD, but I belong also to different network, mainly the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. So this is, for me, a very structural issue that we need to sort out so that people have a control of their food production system. We are not emphasizing only on food production, but emphasizing on the food system. We need a sustainable concept that accounts for the needs of the small-scale food producers and the consumers. I'm a policy advisor for World Food and Agriculture at the Inkota Network. We formed an alliance of various development organizations and joined forces with five African partner organizations to publish a study on AGRA entitled False Promises. My name is Mutin Tanketani. I was the consultant on this research in Zambia. And the focus of the study was on the impact of uh, Agra's work in agriculture in Zambia. All of the people interviewed in this audio feature contributed to the study. They report on its findings via video interview. My name is Timothy A. Wise, and I'm a senior fellow at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University as a researcher. I conducted background research for this report that has resulted in an academic working paper. And then I helped author this report, uh, summarizing the failures of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. I coordinate the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's Food Sovereignty Program, based in Johannesburg in South Africa. False promises? Failures? Agra? What exactly are we talking about here? The name Agra already says it all. It stands for the Green Revolution. AGRA is short for Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And it gets a huge amount of support from influential players. For example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of AGRA's largest funders, alongside a large number of governments and countries in Africa, as well as many donor governments such as the US and Germany. Well, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa was initiated in 2006 
And AGRA was chartered with the mission of bringing agricultural productivity through the kinds of industrial agricultural technologies that are used in the United States and much of the industrialized world. AGRA operates in numerous African countries, cooperating with ministries of agriculture and state research facilities which help determine agricultural policy. AGRA also helps establish private sector initiatives at local level and supports them with aid and loan programs. So AGRA is a key player. It came on a philanthropic way, but introducing mm -hmm. industrial system and giving space for corporate industry to access to smallholder farmers in their villages. They are viewed as an important player in the battle against hunger because they're very skilled at influencing the narrative. AGRA set out with ambitious goals. It aims to reach 30 million small-scale farming households, currently in 13 focus countries. That would account for nearly all small-scale farms operating in these countries. It aims to boost their productivity by 100%, thereby doubling the income of 30 million small-scale food producers. The ultimate goal is to halve poverty levels in 20 African countries by 2020. Now that we've reached AGRA's self-imposed deadline of 2020, it will of course be interesting to see to what extent have they achieved these goals. Well, I tried to get AGRA and the Gates Foundation to cooperate in sharing some of their own results. They declined to cooperate and provide any of their own data showing their results. So what we did was used national level crop data to try to see whether there is indeed a yield or productivity revolution going on in agri-countries. But what exactly does AGRA do then? It promotes the Green Revolution, it wants to reduce poverty and hunger by making agriculture more productive, but how? AGRA has been built around this input-oriented agriculture. AGRA is about the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution, by definition, is the combination of three different things. You know, the intensive use of fertilizers, intensive use of water, and the use of what they call the high-yield seeds. And high-yield seeds, for them, is industrial seeds. This is the kind of seed that is produced by industries. I'm talking about Monsanto, Sangenta, and the like. A new batch of hybrid seeds has to be bought every year. If they're recycled, they lose the properties that were cultivated in the lab. So year in, year out, they have to buy seeds, they have to buy fertilizers. And uh, now with the promotion of herbicides in Zambia, it has become more like a norm. People have stopped weeding using their hands or holes. They just buy herbicides. So it's a, what they call a technical package. You have a seed, you have a fertilizer, and you have other instruments that they will be using. And what happened at the end of the day? Not only the yield didn't increase, but at the same time, they put more money in producing. The cost of production became higher than what they had in the past. As a result, they can end up falling into a debt trap because they're suddenly forced to buy expensive inputs, such as seed and fertilizers, mostly using loans that they have to pay back after the harvest. It's a vicious cycle. You get in, you continue to indebt yourself, but you are not getting that much because we discovered that the productivity is not getting more, it's not increasing. So it's an indebting system that they set up for this uh, agra program in the continent. In some countries, it is the governments that are getting into debt and not the small-scale food producers themselves. Agra is trying to influence governments so that they use private sector business models in their agriculture policy. In many agri-countries, this approach goes hand-in-hand hand with farm input subsidy programs, or FISPs. These programs subsidize farmers if they buy hybrid seed and fertilizers. This swallows up huge amounts of public funds. In Malawi, it accounted for 60% of the entire agriculture budget in the 2018-2019 financial year. To ensure efficient distribution and that these products are also available in the remotest places, Agra is setting up agro-dealer networks. These are basically little shops where farmers can buy these agrochemicals, synthetic fertilizers and so on. 
And another part of Agra's approach is to give farmers affordable loans, which allow them to access agro-dealer networks in the first place. Because if they don't have money, they can't buy inputs. And this whole process is accompanied by a kind of consultancy service, advising the farmers what crops they should grow and where and how they should cultivate them. Actually, the, the agro-dealer system was their main market strategy. In Zambia, a lot of the resources actually went to the development of the agro-dealers. Another aspect, which poses a major disadvantage to small-scale food producers in African countries, is that they lose freedom of choice. Many agro-projects, for example, stipulate which seed should be used and how the crop should be cultivated. And also the fact that maize is subsidized, you see, in the mind of the farmer, it is cheaper. And therefore, they start growing maize. So the Green Revolution model leads to a narrower range of crops being produced by farmers. And what you find is that, indeed, all of these subsidies and support to maize have persuaded farmers to plant less of these more traditional, more climate-resilient, drought-tolerant, and nutritious crops. And if diversity is limited, then what ultimately ends up on the menu will also be limited. And while maize might fill you up, if that's all you eat, you certainly won't stay healthy. Then the other cost has been soil degradation. We all know that fertilizers lead to acidic soil. So in the continuous use of chemical fertilizers has led to soils being very acidic, and therefore they produce less and less every year. And for farmers to continue having the same yield, it's either they clear new areas or they put more chemical fertilizer onto their crops. So you all know that if you put fertilizer, I'm talking about chemical fertilizer in the soil, it will feed only the plant, not the soil. One of the challenges of the Green Revolution is the loss of biodiversity. That includes the plants, the water resources, insects and animals around because of the extensification. It's a familiar image across the world. Vast fields of maize, monoculture, farming machines on large fields. Trees and bushes have vanished due to the extensification of arable land. Yeah, so without tree cover, the areas are prone to drought and also it is easy for the soils to get eroded, which immediately causes soils to lose their fertility. Farmers stop growing different types of food, and as a result, they lose sources of food and plants that could normally sustain them in times of drought. This is a particularly serious loss today, as farmers are increasingly feeling the impact of climate change. So they end up being very vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So input-intensive agriculture is problematic. It is not sustainable, damages the environment, and poses a risk to small-scale food producers in terms of income and food security. There's actually no better safeguard against the effects of climate change than diversified cultivation and, above all, cultivation using farmer's seed. So if we drive farmer's seed off the market and replace it with industrial seed, this weakens local farmers' defenses against the effects of climate change. And how has AGRA performed when it comes to the goals it set itself? What do the study's figures show? As far as doubling productivity is concerned, they were aiming for 100%, but ended up with 18%. So they didn't reach the goal. Agra's goal was to achieve 100% increase in productivity by 2021. In Zambia, clearly this would not happen. It also failed to achieve its goal of increasing the income of 30 million small-scale food producers. Overall, poverty levels in the 30 Nagra countries are still extremely high. And the sad part is that they tripled maize production. Maize is the staple crop, uh, staple food crop in like, Zambia. And yet, um, rural poverty remained at 78%. 
extreme rural poverty did not move down at all with that massive increase in maize production. And they spectacularly failed to achieve the third goal of halving the hunger figures in 20 African countries. Since Agra was established, hunger figures in the 13 Agra-focused countries even increased by 30 percent, equivalent to 30 million people. So if Agra is missing its goals, what is this really about then? Agra promotes maize in part because it's a crop that Western industrialized agriculture has put a lot of research into and has produced a lot of new varieties of maize that can be sold to farmers. So it's not unfair to look at this um, as a way to increase sales by Western companies. So the Green Revolution model is mainly focused on the private sector-led agricultural market. It's all about money, of course. Because while the harvests of the small-scale food producers fail to yield the promised green gold, agricultural companies have already pocketed their profits. And we're talking about vast sums of money. Since it was founded 14 years ago, nearly a billion US dollars have flowed into Agra's coffers mainly from the funds of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But governments in the US, the UK, Germany, and other countries have also provided generous subsidies. And another field of activity that they advertise a great deal is their involvement in policy making and the extensive lobbying of governments. They then call this consulting, meaning they promote legislation which creates favorable conditions for fertilizer manufacturers and industrial seed producers to launch their products onto these markets. On the one hand, this could mean that states will only support industrial seed, which is generally hybrid seed. This may also result in farmer seed being driven off the market. In many countries, it accounts for 80 to 85 percent of all seed that is used. This also means that only seed meeting certain criteria may be traded, exchanged and sold. And these criteria can only be met by industrial hybrid seed. Farmer seed cannot fulfill these criteria. And as a result, it will suddenly become illegal to trade in this farmer seed. And the way that they are not considered these small peasants as the key actors of the agricultural improvement system is one reason we have to reject Agra. Mali is actually one of the countries that has cut the number of people in hunger in half in the same period. And they've cut their poverty rate in half as well. So their outcomes are, are quite a bit better. And in part, I think that is due to them not giving in quite as much as other countries have to the agri-model Green Revolution promotion. Mali has been a key player in the region, West Africa, and even in Africa, in the protest against Agra. We organized a big meeting with 43 African countries representing the small-scale farmers, a big event that we entitled the Agroecological Alternative to Agra. That was 2007. It was just one year after they started. And then we organized in 2009 marches in the street, protesting against the fertilizer that we we're bringing, protesting against the kind of hybrid seed, and just fighting for what we call farmer seed. This is why in the 2010, we had a seed law in the country. And farmers have been key players in this dynamic. Mali was the first country in the world to include the concept of food sovereignty on the government agenda. And in 2010, a seed law was passed, which guaranteed small-scale food producers the right to their own seed. These are the seed that they are owned by farmers first. They can use, share, give for free to everybody. There is no patent on it. So farmer seed is a farmer-owned seed. And there is no uh, legal constraint on the seed. Yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from the Mali example. Hunger, it's not surprising that hunger has gone down because they've focused on small-scale farmers and they have given them more land and better land. And they've prioritized not just one crop like maize, but a variety of crops, including traditional crops.
The impact of Agra and other green revolution programs clearly illustrates that the concept has failed. What we need is a fundamental transformation of the agricultural and food systems. And what kind of alternatives are there to the corporate-controlled agricultural system? There's the theory and practice of agroecology. For us, uh, to be brief, agroecology is more than a technology, it's a way of life. I always find that a good way to explain it is to say that agroecology is a science, on the one hand, a scientific way to look at an agricultural ecosystem. But at the same time, it's a concept that has been put into practice by millions of farmers across the world. Farming in harmony with nature, instead of working against it not exploiting nature in an extreme sense. So using nature to produce in a sustainable way, I'm talking about manures and all the organic fertilizers, biopesticides and all this kind of thing. And it's, also a social movement. and it's a social movement that really champions the rights of farmers and also a concept that takes a critical view of capitalism, fighting for greater social justice and equal participation for all members of society. Agroecology is the key sound thing for to fight against hunger because it's addressing the structural problem that agriculture is facing. We have a control of different factors of production. The input that you are using, you have control on that. Look at the COVID-19 period now. Some countries in West Africa cannot produce enough because the chemical fertilizer that they are used to is not available. Borders are closed. We don't have this problem in Mali. We produce what we eat, we can sell, we can export, but we put emphasis on the food system to satisfy our need. And there's also plenty of evidence to prove that this actually works. Sometimes you get critics who say that this is a romanticized idea of an idyllic business and that it doesn't work like that in practice. Well, there's a study that has recorded increases in income of up to more than 200% in several regions of Brazil. We need to emphasize on what we are doing on an agroecological way to this agra. It's not the way to lead us to this transformation. Although Zambia was just admitted to the alliance, I would ask my government to withdraw its membership. But I would also want the government to eliminate these expensive farm input subsidies that don't help our farmers, but instead channel the resources towards the promotion of more policies that respond to the needs of small scale food producers. On the basis of the study and what we've discovered about AGRA, we have a very clear demand. We are calling the German government to stop funding AGRA. If the Gates Foundation or AGRA has data that somehow contradicts these findings, they should publish them. It's scandalous that they haven't published any serious evaluations of their work, given that one billion dollars has been spent supporting this project over over the last 14 years. Donors, cooperating partners, maybe they should stop funding models that undermine farmer managed seed systems and farmers' rights. African governments they have to stop this relationship with Agra and just do for other strategies that we have been pushing them to do. On a global level, this means that donor countries must make backing agroecological approaches a far greater priority. This means that they should provide much more support to agroecological programs and also develop far more of their own agroecological programs and allocate their funds to that effect. It's important to point out that research into agroecology is massively underfunded worldwide in comparison with research on industrial farming systems. This is a major gap, and we believe that this gap has to be filled. It's possible to create a new model of farming. We really need to reconsider all the systems Profit can't be the focal point of our food systems. Farmers are not farming for profit in much of Africa. They're farming for food security. We still have 7% 7, 7 of people with hunger in the rural areas of Zambia. Hunger is not a fatality, so we can fight against it. I hope
hope that uh, what I've been saying can contribute also to make people know more about Agra and the harm Agra has been doing in this continent and the need that to push it back so that we can just do what uh, we are planning to do, which is the emphasizing agroecological perspectives and then creating more conditions there to fight against hunger. That is not a fatality, but it's structural and we have enough instrument to fight against it if the solidarity is on board. The study False Promises, The Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa is a publication by Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya, Biba, Kenya, Rot für die Welt, FIAN, Deutschland, Forum Umwelt und Entwicklung, Inkota Netzwerk, IRPAT, Institut de Recherche et de Promotion des Alternatives en Développement Mali, Pelum, Zambia, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Tanzania Alliance for Biodiversity, Tabio, Tanzania Organic Agricultural Movement, TOAM. The study has been published in English and German and can be accessed on the website of the Inkota Network and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. The links can be found in the podcast description. False Promises is an audio feature by the Inkota Network and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung about the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Produced by Studio Lärm.